He's screaming. Daryl's screaming. Much more than just, hey guys, y'all, y'all all right? Y'all okay? No. As soon as other person, possibly another male, walks in to try to break it up, it's not like, yeah, thanks. Yeah, we just had some problems. Like, let's talk it through. No, it's, it's Snap City. He didn't know what he walked into. And he wasn't getting out of there. He wasn't getting out of there without it being life and death. I was telling you that because it's Jody's death. And you know what? You're going to hear a statement. He doesn't know who was shot first. He knows who shot first. She was shot and killed by him. And that is the three shots. People that know her, they don't have anything against her. Three shots is an overkill. That's a mad, that's someone angry as you brought this in here. That's overkill. Not just one, two, three shots. And you see Daryl, a shot to the top of his head. How's that happen? I wonder how that happens. A shot to his head. He must have been running at him. No, it was a fight. A fight for the gun. And he ends up, he's already seen the lady killed. And he's walking, you know, and then at that point he shoots, he shoots Daryl. Now let me get straight. I mean, she never came in. That's who saves, you know, that's who saves Jennifer at least, initially, or at least intervenes at her request. <coughs> She's just walking in. She says, Brian, get in there. Go. Go. You know, like, go. I mean, do something. You gotta do something. And everything bad, everything you could possibly, the nightmare happens. The nightmare happens. But it was in the books. Ever since the guy was there, she didn't want him in the house. He'd take everything. Fiance. Take everything she has. He'll, you'll hear it from him. If he's not blinking it, he'll tell you. He's got to tell you because it's what happened in his own words. Was it about drugs? No. Money owed? No. Did, he, did they have jealousy issues about you? No, no. He's going like this. No, no, no. Was that domestic? But that's after coaxing. It says, look, we're not worried about why it happened. We just want to catch the people who did it. Okay? We're not worried about why it happened. We just want to get the people. You don't have to worry about anything, what was going on beforehand. You don't have to worry about that. Because we're not after, we're not worried about what happened before. We're worried about how it ended up. So they blinks it domestic. That's uncontradicted. But that wasn't much. It's domestic. No. When you approach those people, they're, un, they're unruly. In fact, that's why they take guns from you when you're charged with domestics. You can never own a gun again. Now, the state of Kentucky may tell you you're not on a gun, but the federal government says no. There's a specific statute. A misdemeanor conviction for domestic, you never can own a gun again. There's a reason for that. Now, he went to prison. He shouldn't own a gun anyway. But that doesn't stop. I mean, you're dealing with someone. It's like walking in, and you've met with someone, and all of a sudden, they're different. And you're thinking, like, why were they so angry about something? Like, boy, they just popped off today. You don't know where they are. You don't know what people are talking about and going on through their life. Life is happening to them, just like life is happening to each and every one of you. Life is happening to the judge and everyone else in this courtroom. That's why the road rage cases are crazy. You know, someone follow me too close. I'm like, you know, I'd like to just stop over and you know have a conversation. But I don't know why someone's riding six inches from my tail going 75. You know, and then I, you know, cooler heads prevail. But that's why you see these things like over a road rage case, someone got shot. Well, you don't know what was going on in that person's life. They had no idea they're walking into this, the lion's den of what's going on. So they started off to do a good thing. They walked into what was volatile, really volatile. The nerve that someone would bring someone over and intervene in their little, what was going on between them. And that's why Jody, <coughs> at the end, Brian's exiting. He says, go, go, go. And she's like, she's walking back and she's looking in. 
I mean, she had gone in the place the whole time. And we're there just to break up a fight. And then she hears gunshots. And there's a long pause between them. I mean, things are going on. There's, there's words. You can only imagine what's happening there. And they leave. And, you know, they bring up. They first lied to the police officers. They first, you know, they weren't telling the truth there. I mean, it's not uncommon for someone to lie to a police officer. I think every DUI person that comes to me, they had two drinks, two beers. And it's like, well, I don't know how you get point three of those two beers unless they're, you know, skyscrapers. I don't get it. But that's just what they get. I mean, the officers know how to push through that. They know it's going to be a misrepresentation at the beginning. So from the very littlest, the most little details, the most little excuses all the way to the biddies, people are going to tell officers originally, the, the, you know, something... Yeah, it was different. But that doesn't take away from what happens. And when they come through and say, this is how it, it transpired. But someone like Brian and Jody, it's tough for them to try to understand, you know, life was happening. Life was happening over there. Life was happening enough that here they are going out, and she, you know, she probably loved it, Daryl Wilson, but... She didn't want to leave him there because he'd take all his stuff or whatever it was like. She had a new job she was going to start. That's what we're dealing with. And you have to keep that in mind because at the end of the day, Jody's done nothing wrong and there's no duty to call the police. They can make what you want out of that. There's no duty to involve the police. And they think, she thinks of that, whatever, and she's at panic at this point. They leave. And that may sound tremendously cold and everything else, but the only laws I know that you know, require you to call the police department are children crimes. And that's a good thing. Child abuse, you can't turn your head. That's on you, that you have to get involved. But it's not here. It's domestic. Everyone had to know what was going on. I mean, she'd have black eyes and different things. So it's not like a, a yelling and a browbeating. It was a beating. And this stuff goes under. Back when I was young, I'm 50, you know, I'm the youngest of six. Back in the days, you'd see parents and stuff, and it was different. We lived down an alley down in Germantown, and you know, you hear screaming and stuff. But I mean, there was no air conditioning. Maybe one of the kids had one, or you know, you'd see an air conditioner like chugging up in someone's window. But otherwise, you heard everything in the neighborhood. I know I heard domestic violence. I know I did. And it was covered up forever. I never know it. Was there a name to that? But you can't let them fool you about what's going on, because. Everyone then ignored it, and there's an age when people ignored it. And like I said, I'm the youngest of six, and who knows? I mean, my brothers and I wouldn't put up with it. it just didn't happen that way. You get involved quickly, but no one was here, and no one was there for her, and it turned badly. So at the end of the day, I think once it comes out, once you hear the proof, it all adds up. Once you quit, Jody. And I think he's a, I haven't talked to him specifically, but Brian's probably, I'm sure he's justified in doing something maybe over it, but he had to, you know, he's fighting. And think about that, I mean, whatever they're saying, because we know that's true. We know the domestic's true. And domestic's 1%. It's one, it's one, I guess, one hop away from, from the closest people you all know. It's not a hidden thing in America. Everyone's been to houses where they suspect, where they've seen it, or all of a sudden, like my kids come home, they'll be like, you know, Brian's dad, he's, a, he's real nice when I'm over there, but Brian says he's not that way. He's a stepdad. You know, there's all those things where, and my son, 13, comes home and says, yeah, Brian says he's, you know, this is who he is when he's not there, and it's bad. <coughs> so don't let common sense and life Gloss you over because we're in a, a proceeding here. You can't throw away what is one degree of separation from what you know and you know exists. And this kind of out of the loop, this just happened. And you'll learn the real story. And it won't be any guesswork. I tell you that right now. And you'll make the right decision when you come back whenever this trial's over. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Clough. Dungeon, your first witness.
Yes, Your Honor. The call off calls Robert Hayes. Robert Hayes, please. Mr. Hayes? Yes, ma'am. Sir, if you'll watch your step and come all the way up and have a seat in the witness chair. Thank you. If you'll raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, so help you God? I do. All right. Now, you need to speak up. The mic is not it's no. stationary, so thank you. And you may ask. Good morning. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? I'm Robert Hayes. And Robert, where do you live? I live on Valley Road, Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. And how were you employed? I work for my father's company. And on May 13, 2016, did you find the body of Jennifer Kane and Daryl Wilson? I did. Um, do you manage the property at 1113 South Shelby Street? I'm the head maintenance person. And is that address, is that here in Jefferson County? Yes. Now, I want you to tell us, go back to May 13th and tell us about that day. Jennifer had asked about employment at one of my father's businesses, and I arranged it for her to start on the 13th at noon. And her and my girlfriend were very, very close friends. And around lunchtime I called and Jennifer hadn't showed up yet so then I, I called my girlfriend and asked her have you heard from Jennifer she said no I've been trying to call her all morning can you stop by there I said well I gotta go to mom's I'll be close to there I'll just go ahead and run down there I went down there the front door of the building was locked I didn't have my keys with me so I went around into the alley, and that's where we also have a small warehouse where we keep our maintenance supplies. I had a key for that. I went in through the warehouse building, accessed the two apartment doors through the warehouse, which they had no access to. I knocked on their door a couple times, no answer. So then I went to the front door to see if their vehicle was outside. It was locked, so then I came back in. I knocked on the door a couple more times, hollered for Jennifer, nothing. So then I told my girlfriend, I don't have time for this. She lost out. So I left. And then later on that evening, we were supposed to go to a wake for a mutual friend of ours. She was really concerned about Jennifer. Nobody had heard from her. And then there was another gentleman named Mike. I believe that's his name. He called my girlfriend asked her, Hey, have you heard from her? I'm kind of worried she was supposed to call me. Well, he ended up meeting us down there. Once again, we went through the warehouse, my girlfriend and I. We knocked on the door, no answer. Went to the front door. Mike was outside waiting. Went out, talked to him. Then we came back in. Went and knocked on the door some more. No answer. I started searching through my keys. And just as I tried to put a key into the lock, I grabbed the doorknob. And when I did, the door opened. So I just opened the door a little bit and I hollered both their names a couple times. Nobody responded. So then I opened it just a little bit more and I looked in and that's when I saw Daryl laying on the bed. So I hollered some more. No response. So then I reluctantly walked in. At this point I didn't see anything. I just saw him laying there. I walked in when I turned the corner and looked to my right. That's when I, <coughs> that's when I saw Jennifer laying there on the floor. To me, it looked like a mannequin. She had no color. 
and I knew they had been arguing, but I'd never heard of any domestic problems, but I knew they had been arguing. And Daryl, he got angry from time to time that I know of. I've never seen it personally, but I've heard him over the phone when my girlfriend was talking to Jim. It wasn't nothing like I'm going to kill you or anything. It was just what couples do. So I turned and I looked at him, and that's when I saw his stomach rise slowly and then fall. I couldn't hardly hear anything because he was breathing so faintly. And that's when I jumped up and Mike was still standing in the living room area, but he was watching me. And that's when he grabbed his phone and called 911. And then we got out of the apartment. Um, I want to rewind a little bit and go back through some of the details. How many apartments are at 1133 Shelby Street? Two. And which apartment did you go to? Number one. Number one. That's the first one from the door. Okay. The main door at the front of the building. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned that the main door to the front of the building is locked. Correct. Okay. Um, does it require a key from both sides? Just on the out. Okay. Um, and then apartment number two, who at this time on May 13th, who was supposed to occupy apartment number two? Jody and Mr. Greenwell. And are the apartments rented on a monthly basis? No, ma'am. Weekly. Weekly. And how long had Ms. Cecil and Mr. Greenwell paid their rent? They paid a month in advance. Okay. So they were paid up through the end of May? Correct. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about Jennifer. How long had you known her? I had known her for between six to eight months, maybe even a year. But she was just an acquaintance when she would come over to the house and be with my girlfriend there. And, and I knew, well, I'm sorry, I knew her from the past because she worked for my father over 20 years ago. So she, I've known her from the past also. Um, and you mentioned your girlfriend. What was your girlfriend's name? Tanya. What was her last name? Tanya Taylor. Tanya Taylor. Um, so it sounds like Miss Jennifer was more of Tanya's friend than yours. Is that right? Correct. And on the 13th, you had gotten her job, right? Correct. Okay. And she never showed up? Yes. Okay. Was your girlfriend concerned about her? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm a little confused about the layout of the building. Is this a regular apartment building? No. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit more about the layout? Walk us in through the front door. It's an old-style shotgun building. The front used to be some type of offices or machine shop or something, but you walk into the front door and you take a left and you walk down a narrow hallway and there's two doors and then there's one at the end of the hallway that leads to the warehouse building, which is boarded up from the inside of the warehouse. So there's no access for the tenants to be able to get into our warehouse. And then around the back of the building, there's one roll-up door and then one what we call a man door. Um, gone to 6 p.m., who was with you when you all entered the building? Initially, it was my fiancé and I okay. went in through the back. And then we never knocked. We went to the front door and let Mike in. Okay. And then we all three approached the door. And did all three of you go inside of the apartment? To be honest with you, I know my girlfriend did step a couple feet into the door, but when I discovered Jen, I ho immediately hollered at Mike, get her out of here. So then he started to try to keep her from seeing her friend laying there. Um, did either Mike or Tanya go inside of the bedroom? To my knowledge, no. And, Robert, while you were in there, did you see any weapons? No. Um, did you move any weapons? No. Do you know if Tanya or Mike moved any weapons? No. Tanya never went back in. She stayed outside of the building the entire time. So 
Mike called the police. Correct. Okay. And um, did you speak to the police when they got to the scene? I did. Okay. Um, did you speak to a Detective Burns? Rick Burns? Yes. Okay. Um, did Detective Burns ask you to come back to the homicide office for an interview? Yes, he did. Okay. And did you do that? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, did the police ask you for a sample of your DNA? Yes, I did. And did you give them that? I did. Okay. Um, did you do everything the police asked you to? And then some. Okay. Um, did you have any reason to hide anything from the police at this time? Not at all. Okay. Aside from checking on Jennifer and at lunchtime and at 6 p.m., um, did you know what happened that day? No idea. I just know that somebody cannot get in the building without a key and they can't lock the door from the outside without a key. And who has keys to the outside door? Our head maintenance guy, there's one kept at the main office, and myself. What about the occupants of the apartments? We give them one key. Okay. So Jennifer had a key, and so did Jody Cecil and Brian Greenwell. Correct. Okay. Did you tell the police that? Yes. Because and Jen's keys were found in the apartment. Um, did you ever see Jody Cecil or Brian Greenwell after this? I did not. Did you check on that apartment periodically? I did. Okay. How many times? Twice. Okay. Tell us about the first time. First time, I asked the officers, what about the next apartment? And they said, what about it? And I said, well, what do you think? What about it? somebody has got shot here? What if they're in there? And then they allowed me to enter the apartment. When we entered, it was just me and I believe it was two officers. We entered, the apartment looked lived in. Bed was made, clothes folded, bottom of the closet full of shoes, and everything was neat and in order. It looked like it was lived in. And then nobody was there, so we just said okay and left. And tell me about the second time that you went to apartment number two. The second time was again with an officer. This time there was a lot of clothing missing. Different day-to-day -day basic needed articles. And it was, it was just like, in my opinion, somebody left in a hurry. Like, last minute vacation, hurry up and get it. Grab what you have to have and go. Um, so even though they were paid up until the end of May, you never saw Jody Cecil and Brad Greenwell again? Never saw from them, never heard from them, tried to contact them on the numbers I had, and none of them were valid. So we let the apartment just sit there until the rent was up, and then we went in and cleaned it up and rented it again. Thank you, Robert. Those are all the questions that I have for you. Please answer any questions the defense may have. Ms. Erskine? Yes, Judge, thank you. Um, good morning, Mr. Hayes. Good morning. My name is Heather Erskine. I represent Mr. Greenwell. Thank you for talking with us this morning. Um, Jennifer was an acquaintance of yours, right? Correct. But she said you'd known her for some time. Correct. But not, not super well, right? Yes. She was pretty good friends with your your girlfriend at the time, though, right? Yes. And that's Tanya Taylor. Right? Yes. Okay. Um, and at the time, Tanya and Jennifer, they've been talking pretty regularly, right? Yes. Okay. Um, like on the phone and texting? Right. Okay. Um, and that apartment on Shelby Street, the two apartments on Shelby Street, um, they belonged in your family, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and so, you actually knew Jennifer before she moved into the apartment, right? Yes. And so, you knew her, and then at some point she moves in, right? Yes. Um, and then later, actually, you also helped Jennifer get a job, too. Correct. Right? And all of this is, is partially because you know her, and also because she's friends with her girlfriend. Correct. <clears throat> okay. And she was supposed to start that job that day. Yes. She died. Um, and she was supposed to start at noon, right? Yes. 
Um, and she seemed pretty excited to start. She did. Okay. Um, so, do you know right about when Jennifer moved into the apartment? She had been there, I want to say two or three months. I'm not sure exactly what day it is. I've rent so many apartments, I can't really keep track. Unless it's a problem every person where it's like every other week I got to try to collect their rent. Okay. Well, Jennifer also, she was on disability. She got a check and she paid hers in advance. So she'd been there a couple months. Yeah. Um, and during this time, it was mostly Jennifer that lived there by herself, right? Correct. Until Daryl was released. Okay. And that's because Daryl was in jail or in prison or incarcerated. Right. right. Okay. And do you know when about he was released specifically? No, I did not. I know he had been out for some time. To me, sometimes is two, three weeks, maybe, maybe longer. Okay. But not the whole time, Jennifer? No, not the whole time, no. Okay. And um, sometime after Jennifer moved into the apartment, um, Jody moved into the other apartment, right? Correct. And you all rented that apartment to Jody? Yes. Um, and Jennifer had known Jody before Jody moved in, right? Yes. Um, and in fact, is that how you came to rent the apartment to Jody? Yes. Was through Jennifer? Correct. And that's because Jennifer said, hey, someone I know or one of my friends is looking for an apartment, and you said, okay. Yes. <clears throat> okay. And Jennifer had recommended them for, for the apartment to you? Correct. Uh, and again, only two apartments in that building, right? Yes. And then there's a warehouse of some kind as well, right? Correct. Okay. I want to talk briefly about the door. Um, I just want to be a little bit more specific. So the front door to the to the house, not the apartments, but to the house itself, right? Um, there's there's a like a heavy door, and then there's a screen door in front of it, right? Correct. Okay, and and there's a, a deadbolt that locks the heavy door, right? Yes. And then there's like another lock of some kind to the screen door. No. Right? There's not a lock to the screen door. No. Okay, so um, if you come to the apartment, you're always going to be able to open that screen door. Correct. And then the, the, the heavy door is locked, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, so going to <coughs> Daryl, um, you didn't know him very well, right? Correct. Um, you, knew, you had known Jennifer for longer than Daryl, right? Yes. And um, you actually met Daryl because he was dating Jennifer. Correct. Um, and you'd only seen him a few times. Handful of times. Handful of times, okay. And you hadn't really talked to him that much, right? Just general conversation. And, and you knew him as Jennifer's boyfriend? Correct. Um, and you knew vaguely that, that Daryl and Jennifer had been fighting sometimes, right? I went, you say fighting, I had to say arguing. Okay. So you knew that they had um, been arguing? They had words, yes. Okay. Um, and you knew that, um, you knew that Tanya had talked to Jennifer the day before this happened, right? I did. Um, and you knew that... Daryl was supposed to move out. I did. And um, you knew that, in fact, he didn't move out the, the day before, right? Yes. And had Tanya expressed concern about that to you? Not at all. Okay. So it wasn't until the next morning or, or the next day that, that Tanya became worried. Is that correct? Well, she was just worried because she hadn't heard from her, and they usually call each other in the morning, and Jennifer had told her the night before, I'll call you when I get up. And then I guess my girlfriend responded, well, if you don't call me by 10, I'll make sure you're up. You can't be late. Okay, and that's because she's supposed to be getting to her job at noon. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> so um, you speak with Tanya in the morning on May 13th, right? Yes. And she told you, excuse me, rephrase that. Um, you knew that... Tanya would try and get a hold of Jennifer in the morning, right? I was informed, yes. Uh, and so you actually stopped by the house earlier in the day, right? Jennifer's? Mm-hmm. Yes. And 
part of that was because Tanya said, hey, can you stop by the house and check on Jeff? Correct. Um, and that was by yourself, right? Yes. <clears throat> and at that point, Tanya was already kind of worried about Jennifer, right? Yes. Because you stopped by, that was right around noon or, or just about that time, right? Um, and at that point, Jennifer's car is still at the apartment, right? Yeah, as, as far as I remember, yeah. Okay, and you knew, again, she's supposed to be at work at noon, right? Yes. And so there was kind of a concern, hey, she's not at work, right? Right. Okay. And um, had you tried to reach Jennifer by phone that morning? I didn't have a number on her, but after I knocked on the door several times and there was no response, that's when I called Tanya and told her, she's not answering the door, i got to get back to work. Okay. Um, and you knocked a couple times, right? Correct. And you waited a couple minutes, and she didn't come out, right? Nope. So you just, you left? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Later on, you kind of, you hear from Tanya later on in the day, too, as well, right? Well, when I got off work, yeah. Okay. And um, you actually end up hearing from another another person, Mike, right? Tanya did, yes. Tanya did. Okay. And Mike was another friend of Jennifer's? Yes. Um, and it was your understanding that Mike was worried at this point as well, right? Yes. And that was because he knew Jennifer didn't show up to work, right? I'm uh, not sure if he even knew about the work situation, but I guess they were supposed to talk. So fair to say, um, no one had been able to get a hold of her. Correct. And so people were worried about it. Yes. <clears throat> so you all meet Mike at the apartment, right? Yes. And um, Tanya, at that point, she wanted a, she wanted a key. She wanted to let herself in, right? Yes. And that's again, no one had heard from Jennifer. Right? Yes. Um, so you all are, are prepared to go into the apartment and then the door ends up being unlocked. Correct. After the door to her apartment after you end up getting into the house, right? Yes. Right. Um, now, what, back that up, please. I'm sorry. I, I yeah, think no, I misunderstood you. I, I think that was a little bit confusing. So you actually do end up using your key to get into the house itself, right? Through the warehouse? No. No. Okay. Can you explain how you get into the house itself? I went to the house itself, to the front of the building. I went through the warehouse, and then I walked to the front door from the back door and unlocked the deadbolt to okay. let Mike in, and then we walked back down the hallway to the apartment door. Okay. So you get in the house through a back door? Right. Into the warehouse, which leads to the front of the building where the apartments are. Okay. And at this point, you know that Daryl hasn't moved out of the apartment, right? I didn't know who was in the apartment. Okay. And Okay, so you walk into Jennifer's apartment. Yes. And it looked pretty messy in there, right? Somewhat, yeah. Did you get a good look of, of the apartment or, or not really? I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention once I saw Daryl laying on the bed. Okay. I more or less was focused on him because I was hollering for him. He was still just laying there, not moving. Did you see that there was broken glass on the floor? Not until after the fact. Okay. And For over a year, I pictured Jennifer laying there on the floor. Everything else is pretty much just... For two years, I've been trying to forget that sight. I can imagine. Um, so, fair to say you didn't really look around the, the living room of the apartment? Not at first, no, I did not. Okay. So... I know this must be disturbing to talk about. Um, you find Jennifer, of course. Um, and at first, you, you thought maybe that Daryl had killed her, right? I didn't know. 
he didn't come across to me as a violent type of man. He was he was more soft spoken. Any time I had spoke with him, he never sounded aggressive. Okay, um, but you were surprised when you saw he was breathing, right? Correct. Um, and just kind of worried in general, right? I didn't know if he shot her, and I wasn't gonna stay around to find out. Okay. Um, so at that point, you call nine one one. Mike called nine one one. Mike called nine one one. Excuse me, but. Right. You, you will notify the authorities. Correct. Uh, I don't think I have further questions. At this time. Thank you. Mr. McClell, any cross? Uh, just a few questions. <coughs> Mr. Hayes, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Where was she going to start work that day? Bypass Liquors. Okay, but you had said earlier she's going to, uh, in your statement, that she's going to work for a, a strip club? No. A dance club? She she was, my father owns. Hold on. 